This is JCU Conversations, a podcast show from James Cook University, Singapore. Tune in as we ask experts in the industry more about their lives and their approach to success. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's listen to today's episode. Hi, I'm Dr. Fanny Asumaru, Senior Lecturer in Aquaculture at the Singapore campus of James Cook University. Today, we are joined by my colleague, Dean Jerry, Distinguished Professor in Aquaculture and the Director of Tropical Futures Institute at James Cook University in Singapore, as well as the Australian Research Council Hub for Supercharging Tropical Aquaculture Through Genetic Solutions. Professor Jerry joined JCU over 20 years ago when the industry was just starting to gain momentum. Over the years, he's been actively helping the industry find its sea leg and in particular, how to implement genetic technologies into the efficient and sustainable production of aquaculture species. Professor Jerry is known as a global leader in application of genetics to aquaculture, especially for tropical species. Today, he's an anchor of Singapore's aquaculture pillar, an active contributor to Singapore's food sustainability goals, and has successfully attained several grants from Singapore government and bodies, along with many other exceptional achievements in research. He splits his time between JCU campuses in Singapore and Australia. Hi, Professor Jerry. Good to have you here today. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Fanny. It's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. So we'll start off with some uh, questions. So can you please share what uh, you do at JCU? Yeah, so I uh, wear several hats, I guess, at JCU, all around aquaculture and particularly around aquaculture genetics. So here in Singapore, as you mentioned, I'm the director of our research mm-hmm. institute, the Tropical Futures Institute, where I help coordinate a lot of the research activities undertaken by all our excellent staff. And in Australia, I lead up the aquaculture genetics program at JCU. Okay. And since we are talking about aquaculture, maybe some listeners are not familiar with aquaculture. Can you tell us what aquaculture is? Yeah, so aquaculture is actually the farming of any aquatic organism. Mm -hmm. So it covers the farming of things like fish and shrimp and, of course, oysters, but also crocodiles, frogs, seaweed, uh, production of pearls, microalgae, anything that's growing in the water fits under this definition Mm -hmm. of aquaculture. Not only so, not only freshwater, but also seawater species. Yeah, seawater and and freshwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and also out in the ocean or in ponds on land or in sheds mm-hmm. in cities, uh, aquaculture is very diverse in where it's practiced and yeah. how it's practiced. And not only for food, but as you mentioned, pearls and other products that can be farmed. Yeah, cer- certainly. So uh, I I personally work a lot with. Uh, genetic improvement of pearl oysters to mm-hmm. try and produce more of those beautiful gem quality, super valuable ah. uh, pearls. Oh, interesting. These are these are pearls farm pearls. I had noticed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, when you started in aquaculture a few years ago, not long ago, but uh, what it wasn't actually very well known. And what draw you to join aquaculture yeah so so aquaculture actually it's the fastest growing food production sector globally and it's seen by many nations now as a very important part of their food security strategy and Mm -hmm. same here in singapore it forms a major part of the uh, aspirations around self-sufficiency in in protein so i actually come from a, a farm in New South Wales, in Australia. So I have a long history of over 120 years within Mm -hmm. the family of of farming. And also I've had this love of aquatic organisms Mm -hmm. for my my whole life. And and I've been very fortunate that when I started my, my career after university, I got a position at a research station, which was a, a cattle and sheep Mm. breeding research station for CSIRO uh, who wanted to start applying techniques to aquaculture species. Mm. So I got the opportunity 
to yeah. um, put in practice my love for both, you know, agricultural sort of practices and mm. aquatic organisms. Oh, nice. But well, you mm. didn't have a dream to be a farmer yourself. No, um, <laughs> no, no, no. I think I'm quite uh, comfortable <laughs> where I am doing research. research and trying to help the farmers. Yeah, interesting. So uh, we have we hear that aquaculture has the potential. It's, it grows quite fast, but it also compared to other food uh, producing sectors, it's growing fast. But it also faces many challenges. Uh, can you name some of the challenges aquaculture is facing? Yeah, certainly, Fanny. So, as I mentioned, it's the fastest growing food production sector, but it's also one of the youngest. Mm -hmm. So, industrial aquaculture is actually probably only about 50 years old. And uh, since that time, it's grown from producing 10% to over 53, 54% of global sea food. Mm -hmm. And uh, like any industrialized food production sector, there are always problems and challenges that arise and that you have to solve. And for aquaculture, I consider uh, areas around dealing with disease and the threat mm -hmm. of disease, one of the most major concerning challenges, as well as uh, bringing out the, the inherent biological potential of the the animal itself to grow productively in the environments that we produce it. And that's where genetics mm -hmm. comes in. And every animal or plant species that we eat on earth effectively now that comes from uh, a food production sector has been subject to genetic improvement programs and it mm -hmm. improves the productivity. But this hasn't happened for aquaculture. And so this meshing of using genetics to try and solve both productivity and disease challenges mm -hmm. is an area where I'm very, very interested in playing and helping the industry. Could you explain very simply, if possible, how how do you use genetics in so that people don't think it's transgenics or some uh, science fiction thing that we do in food production? Yeah, so it's a good question, and I, I do I, I do get this question a lot, Fanny, because uh, now, of course, we have very, very advanced genetic technologies that we can bring to bear to gene edit the genome, mm -hmm. for instance. But basically, for aquaculture, we are just applying the, the modern breeding techniques that have mm -hmm. been used for livestock and plants over the last 10,000 years where we identify the superior performing candidates within our population mm -hmm. for a trait like growth or disease resistance and we select them back and breed from them so that we capture those genes that underlie that trait. Mm -hmm. And through this process over many generations of breeding we accumulate more favourable sort of genetic variants in the genome yeah. and we have a superior performing animal. Now we can apply um, genomics to this type of situation where classically you would just look at the animal and say, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a big mm -hmm. fish, let me select that. Yeah. But now we can actually use information within the genome to truly know why Just it is, targeted. yeah, why mm. it is big and should <laughs> and we keep fast. it okay mm. so means it's also safe for consumption yeah there's no absolutely. problem at all absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. There, there's no there's no uh, real examples of um, gene modified uh, aquaculture species farmed in the tropics mm. Mm. and then uh, the team here at JCU uh, the tropical future Institute is contributing to solve many of the challenges that you mentioned especially in uh, genetics, uh, which is your expertise, but also nutrition and disease. Uh, can you share with us how your team is contributing to overcome these challenges? Yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very uh, interesting question. And it, it's one that I just want to take a step back to and, and again, talk about the industry. So we're a young industry. And as a young industry, we have lots of challenges to solve. But science and technology and innovation underpin mm -hmm. the future success of aquaculture. So what the industry really strives for and needs in the future are uh, graduates who are trained in, mm -hmm. in 
cutting edge science uh, in areas like genetics and nutrition and aquatic animal health to solve these sort of issues that we have. So the team here we have within the Tropical Futures Industry uh, Institute, each one of them has some of those core required skill sets mm -hmm. in an area related to feed development or how do you identify and treat disease, mm -hmm. or of course, how you might apply genetics to improve an animal. Yeah. And uniquely, I think for us, is we all work together and try and bring each of those domain specialities we have together because actually these challenges are not just a genetics problem or a nutrition problem mm -hmm. or a disease problem. It's actually holistic and we need to take holistic approaches to solve it. Yeah, and awesome. luckily, mm -hmm. and, and through probably good planning here, we, we have all the intellectual and scientific sort of capability to be able to do that within the Tropical Futures Institute. Mm -hmm. And where do you think aquaculture industry is heading in the, let's say, the coming decade or so? I think aquaculture is about to undergo another major frame shift in its level of production. And this is going to come from increased industrialization of mm. the industry. So at the moment, actually, there's about 650 aquatic organisms which are farmed. Mm. Now, you compare that to livestock, you'd be lucky to name five or, or, or six, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but this 650 species farmed in the aquatic domain is probably unsustainable uh, longer term because when you've got to invent and uh, solve challenges for each of these species it consumes a lot of resources mm -hmm. that potentially mm -hmm. if you just focused on a few major ones will mm -hmm. allow you to move faster in terms of production of food. Yeah, you focus yeah. on. And so I think this is what's going to happen is we're going to see industrialization of, of, of certain species mm -hmm. particularly tropical aquaculture mm -hmm. species like Barramundi or Asian sea bass is a real good example of that. And you're also going to see major major uses of technology and innovation, which I've, I've always said that aquaculture at the moment is like producing food in a black box. Mm -hmm. So you put, you put the fingerlings in and then something happens in the middle and then, <laughs> and then the farmer hopes fish. that at the end of the day they can harvest uh, a product so we don't really understand the biological processes that are mm. and 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 how management practices are interacting with them in that black box in the middle and that's where technology like ai and uh, various Which other digital sense. technologies will allow us to be able to understand better how to manage that black box and that'll drive productivity as well yes, yeah. so the industry in short they're going to consolidate around some major species mm -hmm. and they are going to integrate technology and innovation like no other food production sector mm -hmm. on the planet. Yeah, and then uh, now talking about food security in Singapore, uh, we have some drives to increase food security in Singapore and do you think how or can how can aquaculture help in this food security and what would be JCU's role in this mm. uh, particular challenge? Yeah, so, so Singapore as a, as a small nation has major challenge about producing its own food because mm. of the, the footprint that food production generally requires. Yes. Obviously, we're not seeing large cattle stations like we have in Australia <laughs> being uh, here in Singapore. Uh, so, but what Singapore does have is has actually ocean frontage mm -hmm. and this allows it the opportunity particularly to produce food from the sea. And so that is why aquaculture is seen as a major part of the food security strategy here in Singapore. Aquaculture actually per unit of land or area footprint is, mm -hmm. a, again, it's the most productive production of protein yeah. out of farm of any organism. Li uh, livestock, yeah. yeah, so in one hectare of water, you could produce something like 70 or 80 tonnes mm -hmm. of fish. So it's an amazing yeah, amount of food. Shorter period of shorter time. Shorter period of yeah. time. So aquaculture is going to be very, it's a very important part of Singapore's food strategy. 
Uh, JCU's role here is like we are the global leaders in tropical aquaculture mm-hmm. research and training. And so we provide a lot of that domain expertise around aquaculture that uh, fits into the other part of the, the, the research and training ecosystem in, in Singapore uh, and provides that expertise of how to actually do aquaculture and solve some of these problems from a mm-hmm. biological Mm-hmm. Uh, and perspective, perspective. and uh, work directly with industry partners and the government to help them realise their their strategy. At the same time, we are the only uh, institution, university here in Singapore that has a dedicated aquaculture major. Mm-hmm. And so we are also, at the same time that we are applying our research capabilities, we are training the next generation of aquaculture practitioners and hopefully leaders uh, for Singapore. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like very exciting times for us in Singapore. Uh, So, a last question. Uh, If you could travel back in time, let's say your younger self, 20 or before going to university, would you, what advice would you give him? Yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting question because I believe that I still have the same passion Mm -hmm. to understand the world as I did back when I was 21. Uh, But maybe back in those days, I didn't realise how understanding the world can also be harnessed with working with industry and, and other stakeholders to create significant impact that benefits the world, not only from a knowledge generation, but benefits humanity. So I would I would definitely tell myself that uh, if you want to be a scientist, it's not mm. just about the scientist. You always now have to be thinking about how your science is going to be used in the future. The second thing I would tell myself is that actually networks are equally important mm-hmm. as knowledge. And so being a very active networker and and being in programs that allow you to develop peer groups and uh, particularly interact with stakeholders Mm -hmm. has, for me, organically come in my career, uh, but probably is one of the main factors why I have been able to succeed in my career. And so having that knowledge about Think about impact right from the start. Mm. Think about how you develop networks and then harness them. Will certainly help the the younger generation uh, be able to progress a lot quicker in their careers, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you, Professor Jerry. I think this uh, also good advice for our younger generation who are just starting up. So uh, I'd like to thank you for this fantastic conversation and discussion we just had. And can you? Let us know if our listeners uh, would like to find you online. Where can they find you? Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Fanny. I, I always love talking about aquaculture. It is you know, a real um, industry that that is not only produces healthy food, but there's lots of future jobs and opportunities out there for young people. Uh, people can find me if they go to the James Cook University webpage Website. and mm-hmm. just search for Dean Jerry. Or you can find me on on LinkedIn. Uh, So they're probably the two main ways that you can find me. Yeah. So thanks for joining. And you can find Professor Dean Jerry in LinkedIn. And uh, stay tuned for the next JCU Conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Thanks, Dean.